This week, I want to go all the way back to the origins of mammalian metabolic plasticity. Your food is not only calories, but it is also a signal to the organism. Early mammals ate insects. This graphic suggests that mammals evolved to use food as a signal as to whether a specific mammal lived in a land of eternal summer or if that mammal was in a temperate cold area and the food is sending the signal that winter's coming, fatten up. This is a family tree that goes all the way back to the Permian era around 270 million years ago. These lightning bolts represent points in evolution where it is believed that uh, warm-blooded metabolisms evolved. And so uh, this uh, transition from brown to purple represents the Permian-Triassic transition at this point, there was the Permian extinction event or the Permian Triassic extinction event, also known as the Great Dying. And literally minutes before the Great Dying, uh, we know that uh, Lystrosaurus evolved and Lystrosaurus was a warm-blooded mammal who actually survived the Great Dying and actually proliferated in great numbers in the early Triassic. Um, but there's this other branch of this tree is interesting to us because we uh, live on this branch. This branch gave way to mammals. And these things back here are reptiles. And it is possible that uh, Lystrosaurus and this branch got their warm bloodedness from a common ancestor. Um, or it's also possible that it evolved twice. Uh, we're not sure. But at any rate, uh, something back here in the Permian, presumably, is the great, 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 great grandmother of all mammals, which was a lizard who evolved a warm-blooded metabolism. The great dying was presumably caused by volcanic eruptions in Siberia. You can see all of this uh, parts of Siberia are these giant lava flows that happened right at the timing of the Permian-Triassic extinction event. And this is where that kid's game, The Floor is Lava, came from initially. And as I mentioned, the Lystrosaurus actually survived that Permian extinction event. And here's a Lystrosaurus, and you can see it looks like a lizard, but the artist has put these little hairs on it, suggesting that perhaps the Lystrosaurus had hair just like a mammal does. You can see these things come from Antarctica. The Lystrosaurus was in Antarctica, which is across the world from the Siberian volcanic eruptions. These rings that you can see, this is not a piece of wood. This is the tusk of a Lystrosaurus uh, preserved in the fossil record. The authors conclude that evidence of severe and prolonged periods of stress in the Antarctic Lystrosaurus tusks support the conclusion that polar populations adapted to their high latitude environment by means of seasonal reproduction and metabolic activity, otherwise referred to as torpor. So there were mammal-like animals who survived the Permian-Triassic extinction who presumably used torpor, the full expression of mammalian metabolic plasticity and the ability to shut down their metabolic rates. And it says these data also shed light on Antarctica's role as a refugium during the Permian-Triassic extinction event. Soon after the extinction event, they start finding many, many, many mammalian burrows. And some of those burrows have fossilized mammals in them or fossilized pre-mammals in them, I should say. They develop this new technology where they can take the fossilized burrow and without actually chiseling the rock away, they can actually image what's inside of the burrow. And in one of these early burrows that they imaged, they found both this, which is an estivating therapsid, which is a, an ancestor to the mammals, therapsids we did evolve from, unlike the Lystrosaurus. And this is an amphibian. And the question is, why would this therapsid, who would have been the one who dug the burrow, allow this amphibian inside the nest with it, where they were both fossilized by presumably a flood. And they point out that abundant fossilized burrow casts immediately after the Permo-Triassic boundary in southern Africa suggest that fossorialism, which means burrowing, was widely developed in many tetrapods, which means things with four legs, more than 250 million years ago. Uh, and as this period is characterized by harsh climatic conditions, the disproportionate density of these ichno fossils in the Karoo, which is southern Africa, reflects the survival strategy adopted by many four-legged animals. 
And this is the actual animal found in that burrow. It was a small synapsid, roughly the size of a fox, and possibly covered in hair because it's a mammalian ancestor. And the dentition suggests that it was a carnivore, focusing its diet mostly on insects, small herbivores, and invertebrates. And the insects, of course, are important to this story. And so the question in this article is, why would the therapsid, uh, the mammalian ancestor, allow this amphibian to share its burrow with it? They logic through all of the explanations, and they find that estivation is the most plausible interpretation. Estivation is a state of animal dormancy similar to hibernation, although taking place in the summer rather than in the winter. Even today, there are non-mammalian animals that estivate, including the North American desert tortoises, crocodiles, and salamanders. This particular animal did not have the marks on the bones to suggest that it was a true hibernator, but they think that metabolic plasticity existed in this mammalian forerunner. Metabolic plasticity is interesting to humans because this John Speakman paper in Nature showed that human metabolic rate has declined over the last 100 years. And so humans are also expressing our metabolic plasticity and we are lowering our metabolic rates. There are also mammals who estivate. The Malagasy fat-tailed dwarf lemur hibernates or estivates in a small tree hole for seven months of the year in the tropics. According to the Oakland Zoo, four-toed hedgehogs are thought to estivate during the dry season. Furthermore, this is the California ground squirrel. It can have two periods of dormancy during the year, including hibernating through the winter, but also summer estivation. And so when we look at the history of torpor, the history of mammalian metabolic plasticity, we evolved from reptiles who had the ability to estivate. Some reptiles also hibernate. We had developed warm blood before the Permian-Triassic extinction event. So you had hot-blooded mammals running around. Then came the age of dying. The only animals that survived the great dying were presumably in Antarctica, this refugia, the furthest you could get on the planet away from the volcanoes, but a cold weather area where there was seasonable food variability. The proto mammals that survived presumably had metabolic plasticity. They were burrowing mammals from cold weather regions. And so I wanna talk about echidnas in this episode. Echidnas are the spiny anteater. When you look at an echidna, you are looking into the Jurassic, which is when the last common ancestor of humans and uh, platypuses and echidnas existed. Here's the Paleozoic. This is when the first uh, warm-blooded metabolism evolved, then the Permian extinction event, and during the Triassic, true mammals evolved. And during the Mesozoic, during the sort of peak age of the dinosaurs, the Jurassic, of course, Jurassic Park, that is when the ancestor that gave way to both humans and echidnas lived. So this video was filmed during the Jurassic. You can see our intrepid echidna searching for ants and termites in the shadow of the great Brontosaurus. Echidnas are interesting because they have traits of both reptiles and mammals. They have all of the most uh, abundant milk proteins in the cow. They have casein. So once things in biology evolve, they tend to stay the same way for very long periods of time because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And so echidna has the same milk genes as a cow does. But the male echidnas also have a venom gland and baby echidnas have egg teeth that helps them cut their way out of the eggshell. These two things are characteristic of reptiles. This is characteristic of mammals. Termites and ants are the preferred foods of the echidna. This is much like the earlier therapsids that we evolved from. And so, like I say, these echidnas are very similar to the ancestral uh, mammal that we all evolved from. An interesting factoid about echidnas is their body temperature is only about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so they're, they're warm-blooded, but later generations of mammals evolve some new tricks like brown adipose tissue that echidnas don't have and perhaps other ways to stabilize their metabolism. So when you look at an echidna, you're kind of looking at uh, mammalian metabolism 1.0. You can see how primordial they are. Uh, they don't have nipples. They have a single uh, cloaca, which is an, a single opening for urination, defecation, and mating. And that's a baby 
echidna called a puggle. They're very cute. And so this paper is a very interesting, thoughtful discussion about echidnas and hibernation. They say, we think that the functional significance of hibernation in echidnas is unlikely to be to avoid either cold conditions or food shortage, except in the very small area of its habitat, which becomes snow clad. Echidnas live in Australia, remember? It's uh, mostly a subtropical environment, although it runs pretty far to the south. And they say, firstly, hibernation occurs in places with very mild winters. Secondly, although data are few and hard to obtain, ants and termites, which form most of the echidna diet, appear to remain available throughout the year. Thirdly, echidnas enter hibernation surprisingly early. In the Australian Alps, even at altitudes well below the winter snow line, we found that some echidnas entered hibernation early in autumn, long before the onset of snow or harsh weather. They go on to say our hypothesis predicts that those with good body condition would enter hibernation, while those which have not been able to forge sufficiently effectively to reach a point where they can afford to rest at a cooler body temperature until it is time to breed would be better to continue to forage throughout the winter. We think this is the first time it has been suggested that hibernation may occur in the absence of environmental stress just to conserve stored energy. And they point out that short-term torpor, however, has been interpreted in this light. Carpenter and Hickson describe torpor entry under natural conditions by a fat, immature male hummingbird at an en route stopover during migration they calculate that by entering torpor rather than remaining normal thermic a saving of about 10 percent of its total fat reserve was made yes birds also use torpor to conserve energy and birds also evolve from reptiles they point out another example Fascinating studies on mouse lemurs provide another interesting example. So this is a tropical primate. This is pretty close to us on the mammalian family tree. These tiny Madagascan primates, 50 to 100 grams, forage in the early part of the night and on some nights enter torpor. Their arousal from torpor is assisted by ectothermic warming as the day warms up until a point at which rapid return to normal thermia is initiated by increased heat production. At the bottom, it says, these observations were interpreted in the context of an ability to cope with shortages of food and water, although these little primates entered torpor spontaneously with food and water available. And they asked the question, could torpor slash hibernation be an echo of reptilian ancestry? You can probably guess from this video that that's what I think is happening. Causes, what are the factors that cause torpor? Day length. Uh, torpor is certainly tied in with day length, but it's complicated because some animals enter torpor in the tropics uh, where the day length is not really changing. Uh, temperature can be a factor, but again, uh, tropical animals are hibernating when it's hot during the summer. And so that really is variable. Could it be food shortage? It can be food shortage, but food shortage is not a necessity of torpor. And so it seems to me like there is some other intrinsic factor, which is really the thing driving the expression of mammalian metabolic plasticity. In the lab, you can cause mice to have a torpor event. Um, you can cause mice to go into torpor by feeding them a drug called bezofibrate. Bezofibrate is a pharmaceutical drug that activates something called PPAR alpha, and you can see they put the bezofibrate in the food of these mice, and by day nine, they're starting to have what are called test drops. These are where animals are not fully torpid, but their body temperature and their metabolic rate starts to drop. You know, they're getting closer to having the right internal combination that will uh, send them into actual full-blown torpor, and you can see uh, torpor comes on day 12, 13, and 14 of consuming this drug that activates PPAR alpha. And so we could say that activating PPAR alpha is seems to be sufficient in some species to cause torpor. So this is in a free ranging echidna and they've put a tiger on it that is recording their body temperature and sending it back. And you can see uh, this is in February, which is fall in the Southern hemisphere. And here the animal is in torpor, but you can see in the days before, these are test drops where the metabolic rate is dropping significantly, but they're not in torpor yet. And I'm making the suggestion that uh, an adult human with metabolic syndrome is doing something like a test drop of their metabolism. What is PPAR alpha? PPAR alpha monitors fatty acids. 
Uh, so these can come either from the diet or they can come from adipose tissue and they bind the PPAR alpha and it goes into the nucleus and it will turn on a bunch of other genes uh, depending on uh, what has, you know, based on being activated by certain fats. You can see the, you can see the single bend in this fat suggests that it is a monounsaturated fat. And so that suggests maybe we should look at the body composition of these echidnas. Are they in a metabolic state, which would cause them to activate PPAR alpha and potentially become torpid? This column here, you can see the echidna. This is pre-hibernation. This column here is after hibernation, uh, post-hibernation, and this is the ants. This is the fat composition of the larva of the ants that they eat. And it says over here, Echidna depot fatty acid composition during the pre-hibernation season was almost identical to that of the most abundant prey species, Iridomyrmex. <laughs> it says oleic acid was by far the most common fatty acid in both the ant and the echidna fat depot. And you can see this is 18.1 indeed is 62% in the echidna, 60% in the ant. The ants don't have a lot of linoleic acid. So in a lot of rodent hibernators, these polyunsaturated fats have shown to be very important, less so seemingly in some of the non-rodents. And you can see this other monounsaturated fat uh, peaks right before hibernation at almost 7%. And when they come out of hibernation, uh, the palmitoleic acid, 16.1, goes from almost 7% down to below 5%. The oleic acid goes from 62% down to 50%. And Linoleic acid actually rises from 5.4% uh, up to 7.5%. And so these are the fats that activate uh, PPR alpha. This is the fats that PPR alpha is monitoring for. You can see that these monounsaturated fats activate PPAR alpha, especially uh, palmitoleic acid, 16-1, the thing that peaked uh, pre-hibernation. And this is active at very low uh, levels, one micromolar, whereas oleic acid, which also activates PPR alpha, has to be present in about 25 times the concentration to get the same stimulating effect on PPR alpha that palmitoleic acid has. So out of all of the fats, the one that at the lowest uh, concentration most activates PPAR alpha is this palmitoleic acid. When we consume oleic acid, we create something called oleoil ethanolamide, which is an endogenous PPAR alpha agonist, which means it activates PPAR alpha very strongly. And so this OEA is made in response to dietary oleic acid. And this is an interesting study that came out this year. They fed mice. Uh, this load is a low oleic acid diet, and you can see the oleic acid in this diet is less than 10% of the high ole of the oleic acid diet, and they replace it with stearic acid, which goes, uh, which they increase by about sixfold. So there's something called the DI18, which is a desaturase index, and it's just the ratio of oleic acid to stearic acid. So in the high oleic acid diet, this number is high; it's 5.4. In the low oleic acid, it's down to 0.07. And what we see is that in mice that don't get fed oleic acid, they have low OEA, as you might expect, because we're not giving them the fuel to make OEA and activate PPAR alpha. Uh, they actually consume more food than the other mice, but their body weight is lower. And specifically, uh, this uh, particular type of white adipose tissue, you see significantly less of this uh, fat tissue this Tomlinson paper suggests that PPAR alpha actually activates an enzyme called SCD1. That's interesting because SCD1 converts saturated fats to monounsaturated fats. So SCD1, uh, which is activated by PPAR alpha, increases the amounts of the things that activate PPAR alpha. And so you see a nice little positive feedback loop here uh, between SCD1 and PPAR alpha. And so we can say there are multiple factors that, that affect PPR alpha. One of them is an exogenous factor uh, coming from outside of the body, which is dietary oleic acid, which creates OEA and activates PPAR alpha. But of course, there's other endogenous factors, and, and that's also the amount of monounsaturated fats in our fat cells. Uh, in particular, this palmitoleic acid, 16-1, is a very good activator of PPAR alpha, but of course, the 
dietary 18-1 leads to increased endogenous oleic acid in our fat stores. One, because it can be stored directly as oleic acid, and two, because it increases SCD1, which increases production of these other MUFA. And so how is that signal transmitted to the mammal? How does the mammal know whether or not uh, it should store fat and begin the process of becoming torpid for winter and so a very interesting thing is if you look at insects insects in the tropics have a lot more saturated fat than insects in temperate regions generally speaking uh insects in temperate regions have a lot more monounsaturated fat and so this study looked at uh edible red and black ants in thailand and china and this is what they found so this is in uh, thailand uh it's from kind of central thailand and they looked at these ants and you can see uh, obviously thailand is quite warm uh it only gets down to the low 60s at night in the coldest part of the year this is january and these ants are about nine percent of their body weight is fat uh once they're dried and they have about 32% saturated fat and about 59% monounsaturated fat and about 8% polyunsaturated fat. Now we're moving up to Wenzhou in China. And so this is coastal China. And so it's, it's a lot colder there, of course, uh, than in Thailand. And the winter gets down to about 42 degrees. And the on the extreme events, maybe down to 34 or 35 degrees. But it's not really a place... Uh, where you have a lot of freezing because it's on the coast. And the ants there have, in the colder region, have far more monounsaturated fat, 73%. Uh, they only have 23% saturated fat and only 4% polyunsaturated fat. Uh, but they're pretty low in body fat, only 6% fat in these black ants that you find on the coast. Now, if we move into a mountainous area, we can look at Guizhou. So this is a uh, higher elevation. It's actually a little bit south of Wenzhou, but this is an elevated region and you can see it gets a lot colder. Uh, the normal January temperatures are 36, but they can get down well below freezing. And these ants have about the same fat composition, about 72% MUFA in this case, uh, but they have a lot more body fat. They have about 15% body fat as opposed to 6% on the coast. So if you line all these ants up, uh, <laughs> you can see that. Uh, so, so this is uh, ants are of course have a lot of protein and some fat. And so the Thai ants would have given about 27% of calories as fat. About 16% of that would have been MUFA. The Wenzhou ants, uh, they're lower. They, they have a lot of MUFA, but they're lower in total fat. So those would only have been about 14% of fats from MUFA and about 1.8% from palmitoleic acid. Uh, and the Guizhou ants, these are up to 40% of calories as fat and that's interesting because that is a number that we use in the lab to induce obesity in mice and the monounsaturated fat portion of that diet is about 29 percent the vast majority of their fat is monounsaturated and if we look at this ratio again the desaturase index so that's oleic acid over stearic acid it goes from nine in thailand to 13.8 in the coastal ants up to 14.7 in those cold weather mountainous ants so the mountainous ants presumably have the highest SCD1 activity level. This is another study just to show that I'm not just cherry picking on this one study in Asia. Uh, they're looking at ants in Brazil, which are the green ants, um, or ants in Germany, which are the red ants. And so down here uh, in the bottom one, this is percentage of, of the different fats. And you can see that in Germany, the amount of stearic acid plunges uh, compared to the level in Brazil and the amount of monounsaturated fats skyrockets to up to 70% of the composition of the ants, just like we saw in the ants in the mountainous regions of temperate China. And the total amount of fat in the ant, which is almost all monounsaturated, uh, goes from a pretty small amount in Brazil. That's about what we saw in, in like those coastal ants, whatever, that's maybe 6%. Uh, up to about 30% of body weight in German ants. So German ants are, are high in fat, they're high in calories from fat, and specifically they're very high in monounsaturated fat. And these are the actual numbers. And so <laughs> what you see is in this uh, type of German ant, the desaturase index is all the way down to one. Uh, that's a very low desaturase index. That means they have as much stearic acid as they have oleic acid and if you look at this and in germany that ratio is 28 they have 
28 times as much oleic acid as they have of stearic acid. And interestingly, linoleic acid uh, goes from maybe about 10% on average in the tropical ants down to almost nothing in the German ants. There's almost no PUFA in German ants. So should you eat these ants? No, they're too high in MUFA. So that pattern is interesting because what happens in a mammal when you activate PPAR alpha, well, this is phenofibrate. This is a drug that activates PPAR alpha. They're looking at rats. When you activate PPAR alpha, saturated fat goes down, polyunsaturated fat goes down, and monounsaturated fat goes way up. So the German ants have the exact same pattern of a mammal with an activated PPAR alpha. I'm suggesting that there is cross species signal transmission going on because of course, ants have PPAR alpha two and ants have SCD one as well. And so I'm suggesting that some environmental factor, uh, cold weather day length is activating PPAR alpha in the ants that is creating a bunch of oleic acid in the prey animal. Uh, the predator eating that prey animal is converting that oleic acid to OEA, which is the signal that winter's coming, and that's activating PPAR alpha in the predator animal, which is contributing to this positive feedback loop. Why do species rely on dietary clues? to know whether or not they should be torpid. A lot of mammalian species have very wide ranges. And so when you look at black bears, well, there's black bears in Florida and the black bears in Florida don't hibernate as long or deeply as their Northern relatives, according to the Brevard Zoo. I assume they know a few things about black bears. And so animals have to use environmental clues to understand what is happening in their specific part of the world. And of course, you've already seen, they might be at the same latitude, but they might be uh, very high in elevation. And that is gonna be a harsher climate and they have to get ready for winter that way. And what can tell you that? Apparently the fat and the ants can. This is all, of course, leading up to this joke where I get to say, the terroir of these iridomyrmex suggests oncoming winter. This is a quick commercial word from our sponsor, fireinabottle.net. Your body is sending the wrong signals because if you're obese, you're full of MUFA. If you have metabolic syndrome, you're full of MUFA. Uh, SEA is the counter to OEA. SEA is stearic acid acting as a signaling molecule. The desaturase index is oleic acid compared to stearic acid. Your body has too much oleic acid, not enough stearic acid. Uh, I sell SEA at fireinabottle.net slash shop. If you get some, you will send the right signals in your body. And of course, this product helps me make these videos and write the blog. And I hope that you find some of the information here useful to you. And I just lastly want to touch on, we've been talking a lot about elevated branch chain amino acids, uh, which are elevated in, in human obesity and they seem to contribute to insulin resistance. One of the things that PPAR alpha regulates is amino acid metabolism, and that means breaking down proteins. So this is in mice with uh, a deletion of the gene PPAR alpha, and believe it or not, you can take PPAR alpha out of a mouse and they're mostly fine. If you remove PPAR alpha, this enzyme branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase increases by nearly threefold. And that's a way of saying that activated PPAR alpha inhibits the production of branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. And that is the enzyme that breaks down branch chain amino acids. So if you activate PPAR alpha, you will not be able to break down branch chain amino acids. And that presumably will cause the BCAAs to rise in your bloodstream and contribute to insulin resistance. This is a cool study. It's very recent. They put rats on these diets. Uh, this M, uh, NC is normal control. That's like a low fat chow diet. This M is a classic obesity inducing diet that they use in the lab where they feed them uh, lard that's spiked with soybean oil. And by my calculation, this diet here will have a, an oleic to stearic acid ratio of around three to one. And then they also have peanut oil. So this is an oil that's very high in oleic acid, very low in stearic acid. And so they swapped out a bunch of the lard and the soybean oil for this. And so these mice 
have a much higher ratio of oleic acid to stearic acid. And what happened is really interesting. For some reason, uh, the mice on this uh, M, this control diet, when they put the mice on this diet, it actually lowered uh, valine and, and leucine, which is uh, kind of an une unexpected result for me. When they switch them from the normal diet to the very high oleic diet, look what happens. Proline goes down, isoleucine goes way, way up, and leucine goes up by a factor of about three and a half or four. And so when you switch mice from a diet with a reasonable uh, oleic acid to stearic acid ratio to a diet that has a very high ratio of oleic acid to stearic acid, plasma branch chain amino acids go up and they go up quite a bit. This study shows that in white adipose tissue, white adipose tissues prefer branched chain amino acids as fuel to do de novo lipogenesis. And so these are pre-adipocytes. These are, these are baby fat cells. Baby fat cells don't use branched chain amino acids to do lipogenesis, but mature fat cells love to use branched chain amino acids to do lipogenesis. And so when you think about that primordial mammal, it's going around, it's eating insects, it goes north. The insects become higher in fat and they specifically become higher in MUFA. Now all of a sudden, PPAR alpha is activated. The mammal shuts down the catabolism of branched chain amino acids, which is of course the other major source of their calories. Those branched chain amino acids in the bloodstream become elevated and their fat cells go, oh, this is great. We're gonna turn this protein into fat. We love using branched chain amino acids to make more fat. This is another study. This is another way of looking at this. So these are mice on a high fat diet that's uh, meant to make them, make them very fat. And you can see this is their body weight. And in these mice in the red, what they did is they just eliminated isoleucine from their diet. And isoleucine is the thing that I just showed you is massively elevated when you increase the oleic acid to stearic acid ratio, which is a signal that you're in the north, fatten up, get insulin resistant, start turning protein into fat. And if you just remove isoleucine from uh, the diet of a mice, it completely reverses all of the effects of putting them on a fattening diet, a high fat diet meant to cause obesity. And so that is the end of the story for now. These tropical ants from Brazil have as much stearic acid as they have of oleic acid. In Germany, have 20 times the oleic acid that they have of stearic acid. Mammals evolved to use these insects as a signal of what to do. Is winter coming? Should we be storing fat? Should we be becoming insulin resistant? and slowing down our metabolic rate. If the ants are full of MUFA, then the answer is yes. If the ants are full of MUFA, then we will shut down our protein catabolism and we will use that protein as a fuel to do de novo lipogenesis and to make us insulin resistant. Guys, that was a fun one. I had a lot of fun researching this. I hope you enjoy this video. Uh, at least 20% of how much I've enjoyed making it. Uh, get yourself some SEA, start sending the right signals, and I will see you guys next time.